Today on Civil War History on the Road, I'm visiting a reproduction of the train car used to return President Abraham Lincoln's body to Springfield, Illinois, after his 1865 assassination by John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater. After lying in state in the U.S. Capitol on April 21, 1865, Lincoln's remains departed Washington in a nine-car funeral train for the journey home to Illinois. The 1,654-mile trip largely followed the same route the president had taken coming east to his first inauguration in 1861. Guarding Lincoln's casket were 24 men and four officers of the Veteran Reserve Corps. Some 300 guests were also aboard, as was the coffin bearing Lincoln's son Willie, who had died three years earlier but whom First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln wanted to be buried in Springfield. Named the Lincoln Special, the train traveled through seven states and 180 cities. Arranged stops were made in Baltimore, Harrisburg, Philadelphia, New York City, Albany, Buffalo, Cleveland, Columbus, Indianapolis, and Chicago. Their newspapers published the schedule so mourners could gather, and Lincoln's coffin was placed on a horse-drawn hearse to be carried to a major public building where members of the public could honor the fallen president. Newspapers reported that people waited in line for as long as five hours just to pass by the coffin. Along the route, citizens in towns large and small paid respects to the great emancipator by lining the tracks as the train sped past, while people in farm fields stopped work to pay tribute. Approximately 1.5 million Americans viewed Lincoln's body, and more than 7 million saw the train or hearse procession. Lincoln was finally buried at Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield, Illinois, on May 4, 1865. The car that bore Lincoln's body home to Springfield was originally ordered by Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton. Specially constructed by the United States Military Railroad in Alexandria, Virginia, and named the United States, it was intended as a private railroad car for the President and his cabinet to use while traveling. Completed in early 1865, after nearly a year of work, it bolstered upholstered walls, wood paneling, decorative painted panels, and etched glass windows. It was perhaps the most lavish train car of its day. 48 feet long, 8.5 feet wide, and 13 feet tall, its 16-wheel double trucks, the wheeled assemblies carrying the car along the rails, allowed the car to travel over nearly all gauges of railroad and contained more wheels than the average train car in order to provide the smoothest ride possible. The car consisted of four major rooms, two parlor sitting rooms at each end, one of which was to be Lincoln's office while on the road, a bedroom, and a small room bearing a toilet. Included in the car was a 7-foot, 6-inch sofa built to accommodate Lincoln's 6-foot, 4-inch frame. For safety, its sides had armor plating between the inner and outer walls, the car also had a newly developed Spear-style heating system at each end. The coach reportedly cost $10,000 in 1865, over three times that of a standard passenger car. It truly was the Air Force One of its day. But Lincoln never used it. Perhaps to avoid accusations of extravagance that already dogged Lincoln thanks to Mary's champagne tastes, or maybe because such a fancy car ill-suited the plain country lawyer, the president refused to accept delivery of the car when he was notified it was ready to be transferred to Washington. After Lincoln's burial, it returned to the military car shops in Alexandria, Virginia. Gathering dust, it required a guard to deter souvenir seekers. In 1866, the car joined other wartime government equipment at auction, where it was purchased by T.C. Durant, of the Union Pacific Railroad. Durant moved it to Omaha, Nebraska for use as his personal train car. By the 1870s, however, it had been stripped of its luxurious fittings and may have been used as a railroad pay car. For the next decade, it served variously as a regular passenger car, a living quarters for Union Pacific superintendents, and as a dining car for railroad construction workers. In 1898, the Union Pacific Railroad displayed a marginally reconditioned car at Omaha, Nebraska's Trans-Mississippi Centennial Exposition. Damaged by exposure to the weather and vandals, 
Showman Frank B. Snow purchased the dilapidated car in 1903. Snow exhibited it in his Lincoln Museum at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, before taking it on the road as a traveling exhibit billed as the historic Lincoln car and America's most sacred relic. Its arrival in each town was grandly announced by 14 salutes from cannon, one for each letter forming the name Abraham Lincoln. In 1905, president of the Twin City Rapid Transit Company, Thomas Lowry, bought it. Planning to fully restore the car for display, Lowry died before this could happen, and ownership passed to the Minnesota Federation of Women's Clubs. Stored in a field in Columbia Heights, Minnesota, the Federation also planned to restore and exhibit it. But before this could happen, a grass fire destroyed the car on March 18, 1911. It was a sad end to a priceless American relic. Although Lincoln was the first American president whose body was transported by a funeral train, Presidents Garfield, Grant, McKinley, Harding, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Eisenhower, and George H. W. Bush, like Lincoln, were all transported to their final resting places by a ceremonial funeral train. Today, a reproduction of that famous car, built by the Historic Railroad Equipment Association, a group of history and railroad enthusiasts in Elgin, Illinois, for the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's assassination. It's available to visit in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania's Stone Gables Estate. Let's take a look. Walking into the car is like stepping back in time. We go first into one of the two parlor rooms, this one at the front of the car. It's in this room that Willie Lincoln's casket was born home to Illinois. We can see the special sofa that was built to accommodate President Lincoln and one of the two heaters that stood at each end of the car. Walking through the car, we can see the elaborate wood paneling, the tapestries, the leatherwork that makes this car so unique and so beautiful. Now we enter the bedroom at the center of the car, featuring a dresser and all the things that Lincoln might have needed had he ever used this car. It also features a bed which, although it looks small, certainly would have accommodated the president's large frame. Now we enter the parlor at the rear of the car that would have been President Lincoln's office had he used the car but now would bear the president's remains in his casket. Riding in this car today, one gets a sense for how difficult it must have been for those who accompanied Lincoln's body on the journey home.